Hey there, we are going to continue our discussion on victory. And we learned a couple weeks ago that victory is our identity because our victory comes from Jesus. And we learned last week that we can have victory in the darkness of life where we have no idea what to expect or what's going to come next because we can plant faith and hope and joy and peace in the darkness and let that come into the light. And the Lord showed me this week that he wanted to talk about having victory in the wilderness. So we're going to start by talking about the word rescue. And so often we think of rescue and we think of like a fairy tale, like, oh, we get rescued in the nick of time and we live happily ever after. And as much as that is something I want to be true on this side of heaven, our great rescue and happily ever after comes in eternity. And that hope is secure if you're in Christ Jesus. But what's promised here on the earth is that this life is going to be full of opportunities to produce perseverance, endurance, fortitude, And those opportunities don't always look like the happily ever after that we long for. But we have a resolve. And our resolve is that God is always good. And we are always loved. That's the truth about who he is. And that's the truth about who we are. And so we filter all of those opportunities to overcome through that truth. So let's talk about rescue. So Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son he loves. So we're going to focus in on that transferred word because being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God that's the process of the wilderness. So the word rescue and the word secure have all the same letters in them. They're just scrambled up and presented differently, but they always work hand in hand. You are fully secure in the rescue of Jesus Christ. That is absolutely certain and true. And so Psalm 40 Verse 2 says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction, which could also go hand in hand parallel with Colossians 1.13, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and pulled me out of the miry fog and transferred me. That's the same. The pulling out is the transfer from the kingdom of darkness, from the miry fog pit of death and destruction and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure into the kingdom of the son he loves. Jesus is the rock. He's our foundation and we are fully rescued and fully secure in his rescuing love. So talking about love not being like a fairy tale that we've been sold. Love. The Lord gave me this image, this different facet of love. This isn't the whole story. In fact, I meant to say that, that all of these teachings or all these ideas that I present, it's only the beginning of a beautiful conversation you can have with the Lord. Please know that nothing I share is exhaustive in any way, shape, or form. And that you can always go to the Lord and ask for more. And because he's the God of more, he's always going to have more to reveal to you. And then you get to share that with all of us. So good. So love, L-O-V-E. This is what I saw one time when I asked him for, I think, probably a new facet of love. I didn't expect this. Leaping over violent extraction. I'm going to say that again. L-O-V-E. Leaping over violent extraction. And I had an image that it was like a war zone and everything's flying. And um, I got hit 
and I'm bleeding out and I, I'm down for the count and the war's still just raging everywhere. And Jesus rushes in and violently picks me up, throws me over his shoulder and starts running out. Bum, 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 bum. It's a bumpy ride and it's a painful ride because I'm wounded, but it's also love. Love is always a rescue mission. He loved me too much to leave me wounded and in the way of the battle. He loved me enough to rush into the war zone, to violently extract me, to bring me to a place where I could heal. He loves you that much too. And we cannot mistake this rescue that brings us to a place where we're safe and sound and secure in him as anything less than love. We have to redefine love, redefine wilderness, the process. And I'm praying that tonight, this teaching will make heaven and earth collide for us and that we'll never be the same. <clears throat> so let's go back to the word transfer. And we're, as we transfer, from being rescued to becoming part of the kingdom of God, a child of God. There's a transfer from slavery to sonship where we have to undo. He's going to undo all of our old slave mentality. And so we get to become a child of God in our identity, in our, in the way we even receive ourselves. And that happens in the wilderness. It's a beautiful place of undoing and becoming. So um, in Exodus 13, they were just leaving Egypt and the Lord or the people saw that the promised land was straight across the way. It would have been a straight shot, but they would have had to go through Philistine territory the giants like uh, Goliath. And the Lord said in 1317, he said, if my people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So we got to take the long way. The detour of the wilderness was for them so that they wouldn't turn, get intimidated and feel overwhelmed and go, you know what? Slavery was better than this. This is too hard. This is too scary. I don't know how to be free. I, I, I only know how to be a slave. So I'm going to go back to Egypt. He knew that would be the temptation. And because he knows your heart better than you do, and because he can see what's to come more than you can, you follow him. Even if he's leading you right into the wilderness. Because you know you're always loved. And so that means... Whatever he's, wherever he's leading you, no matter how uncomfortable it is, it's because he loves you. So Exodus 13, 21 says, The Lord went ahead of them, and he guided them during the day with a pillar of a cloud, and in the nighttime with a pillar of fire. So we have six wilderness lies that we're going to start busting over the next couple of weeks. And lie number one is that when you're in the wilderness, you're all alone. When he leads you to the wilderness, he will never leave you in the wilderness. He will go through the wilderness with you. Okay, Exodus 14, 13 says, Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. They were at the Red Sea and the enemies were coming behind them fast and furious. And it looked like there was nothing to do. And Moses just said, watch the Lord rescue you. So the wilderness lie number two that we're going to bust is that I have to figure out how to fight the battle and get out of here. There's going to be so many opportunities in the wilderness to surrender control and to just stay calm and see what God does. It's a beautiful, wonderful part of the wilderness journey. So then in verse 21, he parts the Red Sea. 
and he kills their enemies as after they all get across, he kills their enemies in the Red Sea. And so the wilderness line number three is, there's no way out of here. I've been here for too long. I always land here. I never get past here. This is where I'm stuck. This is just my lot in life. There's no way out. My enemies are coming behind me. There's a sea in front of me. There's nothing. I, I can't figure it. There's no way out. That's the lie we're going to bust. Because God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Exodus 15. They sing songs of deliverance right on the other side of the Red Sea. And it sounds like um, God is a warrior and the Lord is his name and I will live with him forever. His right hand is majestic in power and it shatters the enemy. You know, they were just declaring with song like, what just happened? We walked across the sea like it was dry land, like there's nothing God can't do. And they sing songs of deliverance. And I remember the Lord giving me a prayer recently that um, I would be able to hear the songs of deliverance over the people I was praying for so I could begin to harmonize in my prayers for them with the songs of deliverance the Lord was singing over them. So maybe that's a word for you. If you need deliverance in your life somewhere, you, you need to ask God, what is the song of deliverance? over my life or if there's someone in your life where them being set free seems absolutely utterly impossible like as impossible as parting the red sea whatever the impossible is that you're looking at sing a song of deliverance um because remember god loves to do the impossible he loves to do the impossible ask him to do the impossible i can't wait to hear about that wilderness lie number four is I can't sing until I, or rejoice. I can't rejoice until I'm out of here. Until I get to where I want to be. We're going to bust that lie wide open. So um, the way God show, began to show me this victory in the wilderness was about my husband. He had COVID. And we prayed and we believed and we sang. We worshiped. The Lord, as he was in the hospital, and he like almost died, and he didn't die. God put l breath back into his lungs and revived his life and brought him home to me. And um, that was my the answer to my prayers, right? He was home to me. He was alive, but he wasn't. He wasn't fully alive. He had massive brain fog. He was still very, very sick for a long time. Um mood swings. He was just not my husband. No energy, um, irritable. Like it was, it was hard. It was hard. And the question was, is this our new normal? You know, is this brain damage? Cause he didn't have oxygen in his blood for so long. And okay. I feel like I should be rejoicing, but I'm really scared. I'm really scared. You answered my prayers and boom, I'm in the wilderness. I didn't expect to be in the wilderness. The wilderness isn't a place we pack for or prepare for. It's just a place we end up. But the good news is, is that the wilderness is a place where God will provide for every need you have. And you are so desperate for him and for his help because there's no other way you cannot depend on yourself because you did not you were not prepared for the wilderness and he's got it all there for you we just have to cry out so let's see that so there was some instant wilderness complications so they've been crying out for freedom from slavery and they Right as soon as they start their journey, they're taking a wilderness detour. They're not going straight to the promised land. All of a sudden, they don't even have water. And so they look for water for a few days before they ask the Lord, who's with them, who's like a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He's, he's physically showing up every moment with them in their journey. 
and they wait a few days until they're parched and desperate to say, God, we need water. We have nothing to drink. And then he shows Moses. So this is um, Exodus 15, 22. He shows Moses how to make the water pure for drinking. And then he lets them settle for a little while next to water. So he not only met their instant needs, but then he went above and beyond and gave them more than they needed. And that's what we discover in the wilderness is that he will always give us more than we need. And so there's another complication. Exodus 16, they have no food and they wait and they're starving. And then finally they get desperate and they say, God, we have nothing to eat. He goes, you know what? I'm going to rain down food on you, but you don't just need food. You also need rest. So I'm going to rain down enough food every day of the week. And you just take exactly what you need for the day. Don't take anything for tomorrow. But on the sixth day, take enough for two days. Because you know what? You need rest. I'm going to remind you about the Sabbath. And you're going to keep it holy. And it's for you. Because you need rest. So he didn't just give them food, nourishment for energy. But he also gave them rest. So they would have energy to endure 40 years in the wilderness because he can see what we can't see. And he's always preparing us for what we're going to need before we even know how to ask for it. He's so generous, so loyal, so kind. So the lie number five is that I'm going to die of hunger and thirst in this wilderness. And when I was asking the Lord about that, he was like, well, what is it? What is it right now that you feel like I'm going to die if I don't get this? Are you desperate enough to cry out to God yet? He so wants to meet your needs. He so wants to give you the desires of your heart. But you gotta, you got to seek him to find him. you got to ask to receive. Are you ready to ask? And watch what he's going to do in response. It's going to blow your mind because he is the God of more. So it's not going to be just what you need. It's going to be abundant. So you have plenty to share with others. And you have plenty so you can have some rest. And line number six is I can't rest while I'm in the wilderness. I got to work as hard as I can so I can get out of here as fast as I can. And we are going to bust that lie wide open. So the rescue from slavery to bondage into sonship and beloved is not usually a straight line. So what's the point of this wilderness? Why do we have to go through these things, you know? How is this God being good that here I am again? it's because it's a time where you become intimately aware of how much you're still depending on you and it's also a time where you get to experience utter relief as you relax your grip on being in control because in the wilderness usually the things you thought you had control on you become like so aware are out of your control And if you let him have the control, hand the reins over to him, you get to breathe this like enormous sigh of relief, recognizing again, it's not up to you, that he's got you, that you're kept and you're held and you're secure and you're rescued and you're loved. And there's not one detail he's overlooked. then you allow yourself to lean into dependence upon him and you go from like slaving away to earn um, love or acceptance or approval or being significant or seen or celebrated and you begin to become a wild receiver of his lavish love of his lavish celebration, of his lavish provision, his lavish kindness, the big plan and purposes for your life, 
You're going to be positioned to receive. And it's that you would be loved by God. In that place where you let go of all the slave mentality. Every time it comes up, a slave mentality comes up and you recognize it. Like, oh, that's not the way a son of God or a child of God would be treated. So where's my upgrade and my identity? How can I let go of this and gain this? Because the old has to be gone, cut away for the new to come. And that's what happens when we're in Christ. You become a new creation. And we're all, he's always making all things new. That's who he is. And so whatever the old news is that's still rooted in bondage or slavery to anything in the wilderness, he just goes, bloop, 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 cuts that away. And he said, this is what's true about you right now. This is the truth about you. And this is the journey. This is the journey of the wilderness, the undoing of the slave mentality and the becoming of a child a beloved child of God who the Father delights in and desires to pour out every lavish, wonderful gift from heaven to earth on your behalf to make your journey victorious and purposeful and for his glory. He spent 40 years with the Israelites providing for their every single need before they were ready to go into the promised land. This journey can seem grueling, like, oh, it's too much work. Like, it's just more familiar to be a slave. At least I know what I'm doing, even if it's not totally right. At least I'm, I am familiar with it. Like, this is all unknown. This is scary. You know, just take me back to Egypt. <laughs> He knew that would be their desire. He knows that's going to be our desire. But I got to tell you, the work is worth it. Bondage, no matter how familiar, it's not what you were made for. You were made to be free and free indeed. You were made to be loved fully. You were made to be cherished, delighted in. And so no matter what, the journey looks like, no matter how hard the work feels, it's worth it because it's your destiny to be loved fully loved, fully cherished, fully approved of, fully wanted. And then you get to love others from that full, overflowing place. The work is worth it. And not just for you, but for the kingdom of God. For the lost, lonely travelers that need to hear this news. We do the work so that we can share that. We can bear testimony and give that away. Let the wilderness be your constant encounter with your creator and all he desires to freely pour into your life. So we're going to bust line number one, wide open. Line number one says, I'm all alone in the wilderness. I deserve to be in the wilderness. How did I get back in the wilderness? What could I have done different? Should I have prayed harder? Should I have made better choices? Um, nobody's going to want me because I'm constantly in the wilderness. My journey is too hard for others, so they're not going to want to be a part of this. It's too messy. It's too, I'm too much, or I'm not enough. If I was better, I wouldn't be in the wilderness again. And does God even want me? Like, where is he? Why am I here? Any of that sound familiar? You just wanted freedom, or you just wanted healing, or you just wanted breakthrough, or a new opportunity, and this is how God answered your prayers? It's not what you were expecting, even all the ways you imagined him working it out. It never felt like this. Is this God? Or is this because I was bad? The wilderness is not because you were bad. 
The wilderness is because you're due for an upgrade and understanding how loved you are. <clears throat> Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I read an article today and it said, um, it paraphrased it and it said, I loved you when you were at your darkest. And I had a friend recently and we were doing some inner healing and she was recalling like a really painful experience she went through and it was because of choices she made. And she, we asked Jesus, where are you? Where are you? And he was there with her and he was looking at her saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And she was so perplexed. Like, how could you love me then? And he just showed her like, I am love. Nothing you can do can change how I feel about you. I love you because you're mine and I made you. And because I am love, your choices will never change who I am. I am unchanging and I am love. I loved you when you were at your darkest. And then this is a kind of familiar scripture, but remember we're talking about victory. So just, Lord Jesus, help us to hear it with fresh ears and hear something new tonight. So Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours in Christ who loves us. So fill in your despite all these things. You know, every mistake you've made, every wrong turn you've taken, every, you know, whatever, everything, despite all of it, overwhelming victory is ours in Christ who loves us. Hallelujah. It says, for I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons. No demon you've been battling can separate you from the love of God. No demon in that person's life that you've been praying for forever who has not found breakthrough or victory in any sense of the word can separate them from the love of God. They're fully loved by God. You are fully loved by God. Nothing can change that. Neither all of our fears about today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from the love of God. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Remember, it's not a fairy tale. It's so much better. It's reality. And reality is he went to the cross. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Nothing can separate us from that great love and from our great salvation. And the powerful hope we have in our happily ever after in eternity. Let's focus in on that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This morning, my kids and I were talking about Advent and um, preparing for it to, to start tomorrow. And um, we were talking about hope. And um, that's the first candle. And my little guy, my six-year-old, just looked at me and he said, Mommy, we deserved to go to the cross, but Jesus went for us. I said, yes, yes, we are loved. We are rescued. We're secured. We're wanted and we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus is the light of the world. And he did that for us. You're right. We didn't deserve it, but he loves us and he did that for us. 
And then my nine-year-old said to him, Mommy, imagine if he was just a man. It wouldn't have mattered at all. But because he's God, he made a way for us. He made a way for us. Just like he parted the Red Sea and made a way. No matter what your wilderness is like, Jesus, Christ Jesus, our Lord, has revealed the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father except through by Him. But you're in Him, and He's in you. And we're in the Father, and you're in Him, and He's in you. And you're in the Father, and you're irre irreversibly amalgamated, meld together as one. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. So in the wilderness, cry out to Jesus. Where is he? What does he want you to know? What does he want to give you? What are you prepared to let go and to receive? <clears throat> when you get through this wilderness and the next one and the next one, you grow in understanding Wherever you go, he's with you because you're in him and he's in you and you're in the Father and you're in him and he's in you and you're in the Father and he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's always going to be with you, going before you and going with you and being your rear guard above you and beneath you on the inside and outside in every way you're going to be covered because that's who he is and that's how he feels about you. He takes the utmost care of his beloved and you or his beloved. And when you come out, there's going to be no Egypt left in you. You're going to know more than you've ever known that you're his and he's yours. <clears throat> you're going to allow the wilderness to be the place where you really let yourself be loved by God. And you learn to love yourself and you learn to love others you're going to be so secure in his great love for you that nothing else will matter and this is the best case scenario the best outcome for any of us and it comes from Song of Solomon 8.5 it says who is that coming out of the wilderness? She's leaning on the one who loves her. You're going to be unrecognizable as you lean on the one who loves you. That's victory in the wilderness. Thank you, Jesus, for detouring us so that we don't go backwards. Thank you for going with us on every detour. Thank you for bringing us victory in the wilderness. Thank you for helping us to come face to face with wherever we're leaning on ourselves when we could be relieved of that control and we could lean on you. Thank you that when we cry out to you, you answer and you don't only answer with just what we need, but you give us abundantly. I thank you that you give us rest, that you call for a day of rest for us. I pray that you would teach us how to rest. You would teach us how to trust and you would teach us how to worship in every season. Help us this week to experience you as Emmanuel, God with us. That no matter where we travel, our feet are on the rock, our steps are made secure, because you have transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into yourself. You are our promised land. We celebrate you. We love you. We cherish you. We magnify your holy name. We rejoice in your presence and your power and your peace. And we ask that you would blow our minds this week with your presence, with your power, and with your peace. We need you. We love you. We just want more of you. And we ask these things according to your power and your spirit and your blood. In your holy name, Lord Jesus.